All right, so uh, my name is David Steele. Our topic today is audit logging with Postgres. Um, I'm the senior data architect at Crunchy Data Solutions, and I've been actively developing with Postgres since 1999. When I say developing, I mean developing in Postgres, not developing Postgres. So that's actually a fairly recent activity for me. Um, you know, but I've been a user, practitioner, architect for, well, since then. All the way back to version six. Uh, I'd like to take a few minutes to, so the, the code I'm gonna talk about today, uh, PG Audit, the extension that, you know, we were trying to get into core this year, um, was actually originally written by uh, Ian and Abhijit at Second Quadrant. Uh, this is, project was sponsored by Axel. Uh, what I did was I, I took that project and forked it um, and made a lot of modifications to it and you know, regression tests and documentation and general improvements uh, with the help of the community to try to get that into um, <coughs> Postgres for the 9.5 release cycle, which unfortunately didn't work out. Um, it was just too big, a, too radical a thing. Um, and we, we couldn't get total support for it. Uh, but right now, um, so we're actually working on, we've got this extension on GitHub, and we're gonna be supporting this and packing, is packaging this. We're also working with Second Quadrant to get the two PG Audit projects merged, um, or at least make it clear which one you should be using for which, because their version works on 9.4 and below. Our version works on 9.5 and above. Um, so they're kind of, you know, sort of two separate projects at this point, but we wanna make it clear to everyone how that works. Uh, this is Second Quadrant's project page, in case you want to go there and look at the, the, the code as it was before we forked it for the 9.5 version. Um, and Simon also wanted me to announce that we're going to be doing a beta 1 release soon. So we'll be tagging that on the GitHub site, so you'll be able to download it, play with it, you know, that kind of stuff. And um, you know, the actual release, of course, will come at the same time as Postgres does, whenever that is. Uh, the code's essentially done. I made almost zero modifications from it to it from when we were going to commit it. So it's basically ready to go, it's been through all the paces. Uh, okay, so today's agenda, we're going to talk about, um, you know, what is audit logging, uh, why you should be audit logging, how to audit log currently, you know, what the state of the art is, as it were, uh, the design of PG Audit itself, how it works. Um, I'll give some examples, and then I'm also going to give a demo. All right, so audit logging. So, I have some assumption, if you guys are here, you might have an idea, but I'm gonna go ahead and define it, that way we're all on the same page. So an audit is an official inspection of an individual organization's accounts, typically by an independent body, right? So that's the audit. So an auditor will come into your company, look everything over, request a bunch of information, and file a report. You know, and that might be for ISO compliance, it might be financial, government, whatever, or it might be internally generated. Your company might be doing it, you know, on their own just to keep things honest. Uh, so the information gathered by PostgreSQL audit extension, which from now on I'm just gonna call PG audit, uh, is properly called an audit trail or an audit log, right? So that's the terminology I'm gonna use throughout is I'm gonna call it audit log or audit logging. I'm not gonna use audit trail because it, it sounds funny in this context. Uh, and the PG audit extension provides detailed session in audit logging via the standard Postgres logging facility. So all the auditing is gonna pop out in the standard log where everything else comes. Um, why audit log? So the goal of the audit extension is to provide Postgres users with the capability to produce audit logs that are required to comply with government financial or ISO certifications. Uh, so, the, the, so the main goal is it's not geared towards any particular thing. Uh, the idea is to give you any piece of information you might need um, to actually pass those audits. Uh, you know, organizations may also have internal requirements that can be satisfied with PG audit. Uh, these could be, you know, um, monitoring. Uh, you can even use it for debugging because it gives you very detailed information about what's happening inside functions and stuff like that. We'll, we'll have some demonstration of that later, but just to say that audit may not be the only thing that you're concerned about. There may be lots of other things that you can use this tool for. All right, so the next topic is, uh, is how to audit log, right? So... The first thing is triggers. Um, so how many people who have, impl who, how many people have implemented some kind of trigger-based audit logging? Anyone? All right, well, okay, yeah, a whole bunch of people. <laughs> right, so, so you know the weaknesses. Um, triggers work great for, I mean, if you can get away from the maintenance of them, you know, most people probably write code to write the triggers, you know, that kind of thing. You, you can get pretty clever with it. 
But there are some glaring holes. The first one, of course, is that it won't do select, right? That's it, you can't put a trigger on a select, so you're not gonna get selects logged, and that's a big problem for a lot of people. Uh, the second thing up until now has been that event triggers, I mean, now they can be used for DDL, but prior to 9.5, even when the event triggers were introduced, they were pretty useless because you just got this C data structure. You know, at least in uh, PLPG SQL, you couldn't do a whole lot with it. Um, and now even, you know, this has been improved in 9.5, but role, anything against a role is not triggered, right? So create role, alter role, grant role, all these kinds of things, these are not included in that event trigger. So these are the sorts of, you know, these are very important things that generally most enterprises would like to be aud auditing and you can't um, with an event trigger. So event triggers are a big leap forward and can make that uh, uh, strategy work mostly, but you've still got these, you know, some of these problems, things you can't audit. Uh, the next thing is, um, is functions. So one thing I've seen at some enterprises, is they'll basically say, okay, well we need to log everything and we want total control. So all access to the database will be through functions, um, including DDL changes and stuff like that. You call a function which actually applies the DDL and then you can log it. So this actually works pretty well. Uh, if you, you know, you have a captive audience, the only way they can get to the database, and, and for, for my entire talk, let's just say that we're gonna exclude super users from everything. All right, auditing super users is a, is a completely different story and it is not addressed by this module or by this talk. Uh, so we're assuming that users are constrained in some ways, they have certain roles, and those are the people that you're trying to do audit logging for. So this can work extremely well, but there's an enormous burden for it. Any simple thing, that you, every new thing that you wanna do, you have to write a function for it, right? Or you can have this, um, you also have to, you know, since you're passing it to a function, it's gotta be dynamic SQL, or the parameter list has to be um, fixed, or, you know, the, there's a lot of problems with that, so it works but it's terrible to maintain, um, but it is an option. The, the last thing is uh, log statement equals all. So how many people are familiar with this? Okay, so pretty much everyone, you know, when Postgres comes to you uh, by default, it's got log statement set to error, right? That's the most common setting because if something goes wrong, you wanna see it in the log, uh, just so you know why. Um, but of course you can, you can bump that up to mod, which will give you inserts and updates, and then to DDL, which will give you DDL changes. And finally you can set it to all, which is gonna give you basically everything. So this is pretty good in a way, because it catches all the client statements. So everything that comes from the client to Postgres is logged, period. So that's good. The problem is it, it can be really hard to parse. Um, Cause you know, they, they might be sending uh, uh, um, anonymous PLPG SQL blocks, uh, you know, the calls to functions, you know, all this kind of stuff. So going through that can be a real nightmare. The other problem is there's no way to filter now. So you've turned on the fire hose and, you know, you get what you get. Uh, so now you've just, you're logging and logging and logging. So not only are you logging a lot of stuff, but it's really difficult to figure out what to do with it, you know, and how to interpret it. So, which brings us to PG Audit. Um, so the goal here, there are a couple of goals, um, but, but really one of the major goals is to, uh, well, there are really two big goals, so let's, let's cover that. Um, more granular logging, right? And there's a couple of ways we'll, we're gonna do that and, and we'll look at that. But you wanna be able to pick the things that you need to log. So it's not just about saying, you know, we need to log everything in the enterprise. If you've got a big, an example is you have a big data warehouse. Um, and, and there are a couple of tables in there that are really important and you need to kind of control access to those and figure out who's touching them. You also have some big data tables that are queried all the time. You don't really want to know when someone queries those big tables. Or maybe the big tables are wrapped in functions and no one can get to them directly or you know, however you design your system. So realistically, in a lot of scenarios, there are certain things that you want to be auditing and certain things that you don't. It may be that for your audit compliance, you actually don't need to monitor reads at all. This is a very common scenario. So you're looking at updates, and the other thing you might be looking at, say for ISO compliance, is who modified the database and when. Um, you know, for certain types of compliance, they're gonna wanna know when was this function updated? Was it updated within a release window? Is that release window documented? Uh, can you prove that, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So 
what you're going to audit is, is completely dependent on the type of audit that you're trying to pass. Um, so what we've done is created these kind of broad categories, read, write, those should be pretty obvious. Um, read includes things like select and also copy. You know, copy is a, is a read command. Uh, copy can also be a write command. You might be copying into a table. So write can include insert, update, delete, copy. Uh, functions are functions or do blocks, pretty self-explanatory. Role is anything that has to do with a role. Uh, create role, set, you know, uh, um, grant role, et cetera. And, and that's actually been broken out from DDL, so I really think of the role stuff as essentially DDL, but it's a little bit special, and people wanted to handle it specially. So DDL is then the catch-all for everything else. Uh, create table, create index, alter table, all those sorts of things. Uh, miscellaneous is the, basically the rest, um, all the other stuff that you probably don't want to audit, um, you know, begin, uh, commit, um, fetch, uh, create cursor, uh, <laughs> you know, et cetera, et cetera. So, because if you create a cursor, um, you know, with a select statement, you're still going to get that select in the read. So it would be redundant information. So miscellaneous is all the kind of stuff that you might want to log, um, but doesn't fit in any other convenient category, and most people are going to want to exclude that. But if you want it, then it's there. There's also a handy all uh, keyword as well, so you can just say, give me everything, um, and then you've basically got, well, I, I would say you have log statement equals all, but that's actually not true, and we'll see why in a minute. So saying um, pgaudit.log equals all does not equal log statement equals all, although they will uh, uh, create a similarly large volume of audit logs. The next thing we can do, um, aside from these large classes, is we can do object level logging. So take the example where I gave before, where you've really got a small subset of tables, just maybe the account tables, the credit card information, uh, you know, personal information, PII, things like that. Those are the things that you want to be auditing. Well, what you can do is you can actually set up an, an auditor role, um, and by granting permissions to that role to those tables, you basically tell PG Audit what you would like to audit. Um, so you tell PG Audit, I've created this role called Auditor, um, and I've given it select privileges on these five tables. And PG Audit will then log select on those five tables. You can give it insert privileges, you can do it by column. So you can say, I only want to see, I only want to get an audit entry when they query the password field on this table, or when they update the password field. Like maybe queries aren't a problem, but updates are. So, and, and this also works for views. Uh, so you really get this, you can get this incredibly fine-grained control. It's, it's a little, it's a little weird to get used to because, you know, in this case, we're kind of repurposing uh, the grant system uh, to do something kind of different with it. So it can be a little mind-bending for people at first to get into it, but once you realize the power of it, you can see how narrowly you can focus on, on a very specific set of things that you want to audit rather than, again, the fire hose. Oh, sorry, it looked like you had a question. <laughs> um, and then, so, so these two things, uh, the first two things are really all about being more granular, right? Being able to narrow down and select exactly what we're going to audit rather than just getting everything. The other thing that we want is more detail. Uh, log statement equals all doesn't give us a whole lot of detail. If, you, if you're using CSV logging, it'll give you the command type, of, at least of the, of the main statement. If there are multiple statements in there, then you're gonna have some problems with that too. Uh, but it, it doesn't give you a lot of information. So the other goal was to give as much information as possible. You know, the, the command type, the object type, the object name, the fully qualified object name. So if I do a query and say select star from foo, um, if your search path is set up in the default way, Postgres is going to go look for public.foo. Right? So I'm, if I'm searching through this, um, and let's say you've got a system where you're actually modifying the search path dynamically. So every time I select star from foo, I'm actually getting a different table. It depends on who's logged on and how they're looking at the database. This is a big problem. So one of the things that, that PG Audit does is give you fully, qual fully qualified object names. So whatever the search path is, Postgres resolves it, and then PG Audit actually logs that. So it'll say public.foo, david.foo, you know, whatever. So when you're actually doing searches through the audit logs to find a particular table, you can look for the fully qualified name and not make any guesses about what the search path might have been at that moment because that's pretty crazy. Uh, there's also things like, you know, the statement number, stack depth, uh, you know, um, the actual statement itself, of course, uh, any parameters that were passed along with the statement. 
Um, these are all things that are useful and, and they're configurable so you can turn um, a lot of this stuff on or off, uh, you know, so you don't have to log parameters. And um, uh, there are a couple of other options. Uh, we're not gonna, if we have some time at the end, we might go through some of the options, but I'm not sure how I'll go time-wise. It's the first time I've given this talk, so you know how that goes, you don't really know it yet. Um, all right, so before we get to the examples, let's talk a little bit about design and, and some of the caveats. Uh, PG Audit is implemented as a standard Postgres extension. Uh, so that means you don't have to do anything, obviously, to the core code. You don't have to compile. You don't have to do anything crazy like that. So it'll be easy to package and, and ship, and, and uh, I'm sure plenty of people will be doing that. Um, so basically what it does internally is it basically hooks into everything that it can in Postgres. And, you know, so the uh, executor, um, process utility, um, object access, I mean, uh, it also uses the um, drop and create uh, event triggers. So all in all, it's, it's hooking into Postgres, I think, in six, six places, seven, um, to get information from Postgres as Postgres is running. Um, unfortunately, it's a little bit imperfect. Uh, a good example is, uh, well, for instance, well, let's just go to the next point. Uh, so one of the things that's, that's a little bit flawed is it may log statements that eventually go on to error out, right? So if the syntax is correct and everything looks good and depending on where it is and, and you know, what hook I'm using to pull this data out, it may uh, allow you to run it and then later on it says no. And it could be anything too. It might not even be permission stuff. It might be you created a table and you ran out of space. You know, you're not going to find that out until the command's actually executing, which is after it's logged. So that's a bit of a problem. We'll talk about some ways to get around that, though. Um, the other thing is that it won't log statements that contain syntax errors. So, yeah. Well, c correct, and, and that's why I was saying this, this one's actually, so these next two are actually pretty not bad because if there's a syntax error in it, um, it, it won't get audit log, but it will get caught by log statement equals error, which is a pretty default configuration. And it's not like the user got any information. Uh, in theory, carefully constructed statements could allow users to figure out certain things about the system if they didn't have global access to the catalog. But the way Postgres works now, any user that's logged on can go look at anything in the catalog and determine what tables exist, columns, anything. If we fix that in the future, this might possibly become kind of a data leak, but currently it's not. Uh, the other thing is if, um, if your transaction is in a boarded state, then nothing you do after that will be audit logged. But as uh, Simon points out, you know, so what? You know, you're not actually doing, you're not affecting the system, you're not getting data back, uh, so it's okay. And again, those will be caught through log statement equals error. Uh, so it's not like you're not going to see it in the log, you're just not going to see it in the PG audit log. All right, so let's look at an example. Um, so this is an example, I, I'm not going to, I'm going to skip the trigger and function based examples because I think we know, you know, kind of how that works. Uh, so instead I'm going to do an example based on log statement equals all. And what I've done here is created a really contrived a uh, piece of PLPG SQL code that we're going to run as a anonymous do block. So what I've done here is um, I've created some dynamic SQL and I'm going to create a table which is called important table. But because it's dynamic SQL, it's not very clear. Like if you actually try to grep for important, um, you're going to have trouble because it got broken up. So yeah, you can put dot asterisk and, and you can do all this kind of stuff, but there's lots of ways that people could obfuscate stuff it would make it very hard for an auditor or someone like you who's assisting an auditor to figure out what's going on. Now, when you do log statement equals all, down below there, that's actually what gets logged. So Postgres says log statement, and then it gives you the do block. It just immediately spits back out what the client uh, gave you. So it's correct as far as it goes because it logged everything there was to be logged, but it's almost completely useless because it can't be interpreted. Um, and there's no table name there, there's, no, you know, there's nothing, it's just a bare statement that you can't do a whole lot with. So, th this, but if you feed this sta same statement through um, with PG Audit and you have a function and DDL logging turned on, both of those, uh, then you get a different picture. Um, so we can see that uh, the first line says audit 
Um, it gives you the type of audit logging we're doing, which is session. We'll talk about that in a minute. Um, it gives you the statement number, which is 33. So in this particular session, when I ran this, was this was the 33rd statement they had run in that session. Uh, the second thing it gives you is the um, sub-statement ID, which in this case is one, because this is the top level statement. So the do block was passed in. We see that and that statement, you know, sub-statement number one. It's a function of type do instead of type function. Um, the next couple of fields are blank because this is where you would normally have the object type and the object name, but there's no real concept of that here for an anonymous do block. So uh, those are empty, but those will be filled in later. Uh, and then after that, basically, we get the exact same thing that log statement all gave us, right? Not too exciting, a, you know, quoted uh, string that gives us the actual statement that the user passed in. So that's a little interesting, but not too interesting. The really interesting thing is the next line. Now we see again, it says audit session. Uh, we're still in statement 33, because from the client perspective, they've only sent one statement across the wire, right? We're just executing that. There'll be a lot, there could be millions of substatements in a statement. Uh, so it's substatement two. Uh, now it says, of course, it's DDL, because we're gonna create a table. It gives you the command type, create table, the object type, table. A little redundant, but you know, it makes sense. Uh, the next thing is, is the part where it's really interesting. Um, it gives you the actual fully qualified name of the table that was created. Um, so now here's something we can search for or load into a table, you know, into a column. Uh, we could even do validation on it. We could go say, hey, does this thing really exist or does it still exist or, you know, these sorts of things. Uh, and then lastly, you actually get the real statement that was executed. So you'll notice that even though the um, uh, SQL's dynamic, we're actually capturing the real statement that was created you know, at the end of that string. So the string gets concatenated, that's passed to the executor, the executor takes it and, um, well actually sorry, in this case it's gonna be, well executor and then uh, process utility. And that's where we hook and that's where we get the statement. So, uh, um, so that's pretty cool stuff. So that's the kind of like extra information we are trying to capture, yes? Yes. Currently, there is not. Um, one of the things, there are a couple problems here. Uh, one is that logging is actually kind of a more complicated problem than you might think. Uh, you know, Postgres actually has a fair amount of code around the idea of, you know, everyone, every process, of course, gets a different backend. So now you've got inter-process communication to actually pass these logs to another process which will write them sequentially to a log file or as sequentially as it gets them, right? And there's some acknowledgments and, and you know, all these other sorts of things. So uh, getting outside of the Postgres logging infrastructure can you know, be quite costly. And for the, um, uh, you know, for, the, for the commit to core, you know, we're just hoping to use the standard logging infrastructure. Now, having said that, yeah, I realize that it's a big weak spot um, so we're starting to think about ways we could possibly use syslog uh, here or, you know, to redirect stuff using syslog. Um, we're looking at maybe even per process log files or et cetera, et cetera. So it's really the next step for PG audit is to figure out other ways to get this data out other than writing it into the, the standard logging facility. Yes, yeah, Simon, I'll get to you in a second. And Simon makes a good point, um, just real quick, because, uh, yeah, you can write your own extension to actually hook that in the main logging facility and send stuff anywhere that you want. Uh, for people who don't feel like writing C extensions, you know, we're going to try to have some, like, canned stuff, but for now, that's, that's where it goes. Yeah? Um, uh, funny you should ask that, because, yes, and I, I'll be, actually, the demo that I'm going to do will actually, um, 
take the logs, parse them, load them into a database, and we're going to do queries and, and look at all kinds of stuff. So, so the answer is yes. Uh, the w one thing I'll say before we really get into that is that um, uh, one thing I'll say is that the PG audit extension itself, um, that'll be going to beta soon, and it's, it's extremely mature, and we've had people beating up on it all summer, and they have not been able to find any problems with it. The PG audit analyze code that I'm going to be demoing along with PG audit to make PG audit more friendly is fairly new. Um, so I would say it's not ready for the big time. Um, it could certainly serve as, as an example of how you do this, you know, how you can parse this stuff out. And we're going to be developing that technology, but uh, I, I want to, at this point, consider them kind of separate. One of them is like new and, and interesting, and the other one has been beaten up by everyone in core and some really big clients. <laughs> so so the, the extension itself is feeling really good. Uh, the uh, analyzed code is, is a project at this moment. Uh, don't you love this? I, I, I put this picture in every single one of my talks. I love it. I just put a different caption on each time. Um, all right, so now it's time for a live demo. Yay. Um, I have to say, uh, I actually cheat with my demos. Um, I get really, I, I cannot type when I'm in front of, I can't even type when I have one person standing next to me. I really can't type in a room full of people. So what I do is I actually script my demos. Um, this one's a little different though. Um, I have a, a standard test script that I you know, that I uh, customize, it, it'll go off and run commands and do things and pause at dramatic moments and stuff like that. Uh, in this case, I've done sli something slightly different. What I'm actually gonna do is I'm gonna run the regression tests for the PG Audit, Audit Analyze program. Um, and what I did yesterday was I modified those regression tests so it'll output notices um, so we can actually see the audit logs that are coming out uh, and it'll wait at a, after each test. Um, so we can back, go back and see what was output for that test and, um, and talk about it. And the idea is that um, I thought this was a good idea because as I add new regression tests, um, I can demo those automatically without having to then write some demo code. So uh, I thought that was pretty clever at least. All right, so let's start this thing up. I'm gonna have a window down here just in case we wanna go query the database itself. Oh. But I'm gonna minimize it for now so we don't have to look at it that much. Darn it. Um, so I'm a big, I don't know if anyone here, anyone here use Vagrant? Yeah, a couple people. I'm a big Vagrant fan. Um, because if you, if you actually go to PG Audit, go into analyze slash test, there's a Vagrant file there, and Vagrant is basically just a definition of what the VM should look like. Uh, so you can start it up on your own machine, it'll actually download the base uh, um, image, um, install everything that needs to be installed, and then you can actually run the tests without you know, and, and, and if nothing else, even if you don't run Vagrant, you can look at the Vagrant file and it'll give you a very precise definition of the exact environment that the tests are supposed to run in. Uh, I've actually built the Vagrant um, instance in advance because it actually clones Postgres, builds Postgres, clones PG Audit, builds PG Audit, run, you know, so it takes a while. All right, so the first thing we do, um, another thing I like to do when I'm doing these things is uh, uh, init, so in this case, it's actually gonna create a cluster just for this demo. Um, so Postgres is installed on this VM, but there's no actual running cluster. So we're going to create one locally just for this demo. That's a little less dramatic than it is for some of my other demos, but still pretty cool. All right. Um, these first tests are, this is kind of interesting, because one of the things we realized when we started parsing through logs is we could actually pull out some other cool information, like logon information. Um, so these first couple of tests are actually involved with that, so I'm going to uh, gloss over them. But suffice it to say, when you actually get into the business of parsing logs, uh, you can do other cool stuff as well. It's not just audit information you can pull out. But I'm gonna skip these tests because they're not exactly what we wanna look at. Okay, so the first thing, so there's a lot of stuff here, unfortunately. Um, but this first test is, is really, really basic. We're going to uh, run a select statement and make sure that that select statement actually got logged. Um, so the first thing we do is uh, here, we alter, so uh, somewhere further up, user one was created. It was actually on the last page, but we kind of glossed over it. So what I'm gonna do is, in this case, I'm actually setting audit rules for user one only, not system-wide. So you can actually set uh, audit rules system-wide, at the database level, or at the role level. So it gives you a lot of possible granularity. 
Um, so we're going to set the pgaudit.log to read and then log relation uh, equals on. Uh, and the reason why we do this is that if you, if you don't do this for session logging, then if for object logging, the, the relations will always be logged. But for session logging, it's only going to want to log the query one time. So it's, if, the, if the query contains 10 relations, you only get one record and you won't actually see the relation names. Uh, if you want to see the relations, then you, you turn this on and, well, you turn on the fire hose too. So if your query contains, say, 50 relations, I mean, that's pretty extreme, let's say 10. So your query contains 10 relations, you're going to get 10 uh, audit entries um, for that. And, and we do minimize the number of times the statement gets output because we've got the whole sub-statement sub concept. So you can say, see previous. Um, but still, it, it can be quite a lot of information. Uh, and then the next thing we're going to do is, um, so this is all be do being done in a super user right now. We will, and then we create a test table, so we've got something to play around in. Uh, and then we grant select on that table to user one, so he can do something interesting with it. Uh, and then we'll connect as user one. Um, I'm doing everything in this demo in the Postgres database, because, I don't know, why not? Doesn't really matter. Uh, and then user one goes and selects from the table. Uh, there's no data in the table, so this isn't a very interesting query. Uh, but you'll still, you'll still get an audit record out. So the next thing we see here is this notice. So the dash dash notice on the command line, when I actually built the cluster, I set the um, uh, log messages to notice. So that means things that are, you know, any notices sent to the server are actually coming back to the client. So you might think, wow, so the client can see anything, any audit message that they generate. Um, and the answer currently is yes. Uh, so you need to be careful of that, or you need to have some kind of barrier. Uh, you know, in, in a lot of cases, you're you're going through some kind of soap layer, you know, um, whatever XML. You know, things are abstracted, and the clients aren't seeing stuff directly. If they're connected directly to Postgres, then they would be able to see their own audit records. Um, it's not very interesting because really all it does is spit back to them what they wrote. Uh, but there are possibilities if they have, um, you know, if they're calling a function, and things are going on in that function. Um, you know, they would also see that. Uh, but again, you know, anyone in, who logs into Postgres can see the actual text of any function, right? And unfortunately, there's no security around that. So, so while it's inconvenient and it's not ideal, and this is some, one of the first things I hope to address in core is to be able to filter these messages going to the client, uh, it, that's just the way it is right now. Um, and then this next thing, we're going to see a bunch of these. Uh, it's a little bit not clear how this works. So the way the regression tests work is they... They run the statement. Um, PG Auto Analyze is actually running in the background. It gets started up when the cluster got started up. So PG Auto Analyze is, is tailing the log. It gets this log entry, and then it loads into the database uh, and into the PG Audit schema. Um, and in PG Audit schema, there's also this view, which is VW Audit Event, which actually joins together all the statement tables, sta statement, substatement, substatement detail, et cetera, et cetera. So in this case, what we're going to do is now that I've um, uh, done the select, I saw the, um, the notice, but now I need to pr test it programmatically. Uh, so it's a pretty long statement, but essentially what we're doing is we're saying, I want to find an event where the log time is not null and it's less than the current time. So this is like sort of a basic test of the timestamp to make sure it, it makes some kind of sense. Uh, the username should be user1. The state should be okay. In other words, the statement did not error out. Um, audit type equals session. Uh, class equals read command equals select, object type equals table, and the object name equals public.test table. And, and then it says, you know, count equals one. Uh, so the test function that's getting run here is always looking for Booleans. So you can have as many columns as you want, but it expects all those columns to return true. Uh, so in this case, we've only given it one column, and the test succeeded, which means that it was able to find this row in the PG audit schema, which means that the, the select that we did successfully made it to the Postgres log, which was then picked up by the Analyze um, daemon, which was then reloaded into Postgres, and now we are able to go and query it right here. Um, so that's basically it. And the reason why, you know, I think this is an interesting test is because it's a, you'll find in here there aren't really insert, update, delete tests. They're not as interesting. Select is the one that you can't normally do um, and, and demonstrates the, uh, like I said, these regression tests have a lot to do with making sure that PG Auto Analyze is actually picking things up correctly and moving them into the database. So let's do this, um, 
And so here's another test we had. So one thing that a lot of people are really interested in, you, know, you get this question all the time, can the users change their own audit settings? You know, because in Postgres, you know, we're familiar with, you can, as a user, you can get in and say, well, set, uh, um, I don't know, some of the enable uh, index scan or, in a, you know, whatever. You can actually go in there and change quite a lot of stuff, client messages, whatever. All of the PG audit settings are SU set, which means only a super user can set them. So whether it being set at the global level, the database level, or the um, role level, even if you're the database owner, you cannot set the audit settings for that database. You, you must be the super user to do it. And so all this test proves is that um, you can't do it. So, so what it does, it, it shows that it, it, you can read its settings, so it can find out that its audit logging you know, is set to read, but then if it actually tries to modify that, um, you get an error, permission denied. So just proving that, um, that things are safe. And this is to prevent some kind of regression of somehow this thing isn't as you said anymore, and then all hell breaks loose. All right. Um, this is just a, uh, uh, let's see here. Same thing, just to make sure that the, um, uh, you know, certain types of errors are happening when they should. These aren't as interesting. I'm gonna skip this test. Uh, Here's a more interesting one. So now we're back uh, as super user. We're not user one anymore. Uh, so we're looking at super user and we, let's see, where are we? Uh, so what we want to do here is we want to make sure that changes to a role are logged. You know, this is what we talked about as one of the really important things. Uh, new roles are created or grants are done and stuff like that. We want to know when that happens and, and who did it. Uh, so, oh, by the way, the um, here, this is, this is, of course, the information that's coming out from Postgres. If you wanted to know things like who ran a command, what database it was on, you'd all, use all the standard log prefix stuff, right? Percent %u, percent %d, percent, you know, whatever. None of that is in PG Audit because all of that can be done through the standard logging facility. Um, so in this case, we've run this alter role, and we can see that we've uh, uh, gotten audited for it. It's session statement one, substatement one, role, alter role, and then there's the command. One thing you'll notice is we have these blank fields again, right? Why, why doesn't it tell us the name of the role? Uh, this is what I was telling you earlier. Unfortunately, um, since roles are global objects, uh, the event triggers do not fire when you do any type of alter role, grant, things like that. So, so even though you're able to pull out the statement, and if, the, if this alter role were inside a function or inside a do block, you would actually get the statement out you know, clearly like, like we did with the create table. So it's going to be a lot easier to look at, um, and you can probably grep on alter role pretty easily. I mean, obviously alter role's right there in that, so you can go look at all the alter roles. Uh, really, in theory, you shouldn't have that many of those, it's at least be running ad hoc, so you can kind of track that down and, and figure it out. But, but that is one weakness, is we're not able to pull that information out because there aren't any hooks or event triggers that will give us that information. Uh, you have to be integrated into core to, to know that. So that may be another thing we address in the 9.6 cycle, is there any way to get this information out of Postgres and get it into PG Audit? Um, again, I mean, all of, these, uh, all of these tests are pretty much the same drill. You know, I'm just going in and making sure that this statement made it into the uh, PG Audit schema. So we won't talk about these too much unless someone has a question. Uh, oh yeah, so in, in this case, we're just doing some, some creates and grants. Uh, so this is just more, more audit uh, role stuff to make sure that's actually being audited. Um, here's the, the, the test that I uh, showed you guys from the slides. So this, that, that slide actually got pasted out of here. So this is one of the, um, uh, one of the things to make sure that uh, we're actually getting the, so if you see at the bottom that statement, you know, it's pretty long, but basically I'm making sure that that substatement was correctly logged and pulled out. Um, all right, so here's a longer example. Uh, so we talked about object logging, right, that you can actually tell PG Audit to log a specific table or a specific set of tables rather than just logging any select on the entire database. So here we're gonna demonstrate that. Um, so the first thing we do is we set a PG Audit log equal to none. So I've turned off all the session level logging, right? Now we're gonna go and do some object level logging. Um, I create two tables. Uh, one is called audit table. And one is called no audit table. So hopefully that'll make it easy for us to keep track of which one we're supposed to be auditing and which one we're not. Um, 
And then I'm going to grant select on the audit table to the auditor role. Uh, that also got created you know, somewhere way up at the beginning of the program. Uh, and then I'll connect as user one to database Postgres. And then just do this nice simple query. So we're going to select from audit table, cross join, no audit table. Uh, again, a very contrived example, but the whole, the whole idea is just to um, uh, you know, get some kind of audit entry out. So I tried to make things as simple as possible. So here we go. So we've got one audit entry out. Um, so it's read, select, just like we would expect. Uh, and then it says public.audit table. And it gives a select statement. So we only got one entry. Uh, and then the next thing we do is I have a test to make sure that the audit table entry does exist in the audit logs. Uh, and then the ne this next statement actually is there to make sure that the no audit table does not exist. It's a negative test because if somehow the no audit table gets in there, then something went wrong and we don't want that. So there are two tests here to make sure each table was logged or not logged as is appropriate. Uh, let's see here. And that's actually the end of the demo. Um, so it's kind of a, a kind of a short tour of the basic features of PG Audit and you know how they look when they're exposed, how they look when they um, go into PG Audit. We have a couple of minutes, so I can be really awkward and try to poke around in the database, or um, <laughs> or <laughs> or you guys can ask questions. So, what do you think? Good. Um, no. no. Oh, oh, sorry. So the question was, is there any way with PG Audit uh, to um, log how, much, how many rows were actually affected by the statement? Um, and the answer is no. Not, um, not currently. Uh, it doesn't mean that there's not some way for us to find that information, um, but it's not currently there. We, it, it was really a design decision, you know, really, you know, from originally with Second Quadrant, and, and you know, when I picked it up, I kind of continued that, was just to, we're, we're logging statements. We're logging things that the users uh, do. We, we are not logging data. And, and that kind of counts as you know, logging data. Uh, once you go down that path, uh, it takes you into an entirely different realm, uh, which is we really decided we didn't want to be in. Doesn't mean we never will be, um, but it would have been a big distraction from you know, the goal of getting this thing you know, to where it was. And we didn't want to get distracted. We wanted to kind of stay uh, on course. So let's see here. That's awkward. Uh, see, this is why I hate, <laughs> I think it's 6543. Oh, well. Oh, no, here's the problem. Um, the, the, well, the demo is very polite, so when it's done, it actually drops the cluster, uh, deletes everything, da, 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 you know, it, it leaves no traces behind. So if you want to actually go connect to the database, you've got to uh, issue this no cleanup command, um, and then it'll actually leave the database sitting there for you. And that's when you want to, um, oh, sorry, this, this is actually a schema. And this is actually, um, let me, uh, I'm just going to do, talk about the fire hose, but um, anyway, so this is, this is that view we were querying before. Um, and, you know, you can see at the top, so that's basically everything kind of, oh, sorry. I'll do backside to X. Oh, uh, yeah. Now, now just that again. Okay, that's a lot better. Thank you. Yeah, <laughs> I always forget that. I'm not really the biggest P-SQL person in the world, but, you know. Um, and ta-da. So here's all the stuff we did or at least all the stuff that we asked to be audited. And in this case, of course, you can see that the um, audit analyze routine actually does pull out usernames, timestamps, session IDs, all this interesting information. So that all makes its way into the database. Um, and if you do your own, you know, roll your own, you can get all that same information. It's just PG Audit itself does not export it. Um, Ta-da. And so at the top level, So here's kind of the top level table. Um, I don't have, I really should, this, I have another set of regression tests that, that demonstrates errors, but I have, um, oh, you know, actually it was the one, oh, shoot. Hmm. 
this is very interesting because I thought one of these would actually be in an error state. I think that's somewhere else. Oh well, anyway. Uh, one of the things that it does, and, I, and I'm not sure why we didn't actually hit this, was that, um, remember I told you earlier, you can't, a PG audit can't really tell you if a statement that ran later errored out. Uh, PG audit analyze actually will do that. Because um, it'll be looking at the, um, at the statement, and if it sees later that that ended in error, it'll actually come back and mark the statement as errored and give you the uh, line number uh, in the log where that actually happened. So you can actually follow that back to that table and get the, um, the uh, you know, all the information. Because in this case, at least, oops. shoot. Now these are the, um, Is it? Ah, log event. Okay. So you've also got lots of good information about what went on uh, here, and um, you can have whatever. So it's basically going to bring the logs in and log just about everything that happened, so you can uh, query that as well. Anyway, lots of good information. So the next thing to be done, the other thing about PG Audit right now is, or PG, PG Audit Analyze, it also doesn't have any filters on it. Um, so I want to be able to say only log the, you know, only put the log events in there that are actually related to some audit event and some other thing like that, but I haven't really quite gotten around to that yet. As I said, PG Audit Analyze is still sort of in its infancy, um, but if nothing else, my, my hope is that, you know, it'll be there on a, on a uh, repository and if people want to, you know, one of the big questions I get is, how do you use this? How do you parse it? How do you whatever? So even if people don't want to use PG Audit Analyze, they can actually look at it and it's a working example of how you can get this data out of the logs and get it into a schema or pass that, put it into RabbitMQ or do whatever you're going to do with it. Um, let's see here. Da, da. All right, so that is all I have for today. Uh, it's my email address. Um, here's the uh, GitHub page where the project is, is hosted. Um, I also have... Um, you know, my slides and, and the demo are there. Are there any more questions? I was just going to mention, you talk about the proverbial, proverbial fire hose. I mean, we've gotten situations before where you needed to see SQL or select statements in, uh, executing mm -hmm. so we turn log and configuration to zero. Right. Yeah, if, if you're doing it for a temporary thing to sort of do debugging or analysis, you can get away with that. Uh, in, in most audit logging situations, it's something that's on 24-7 because you need right. to always be prepared to. But, but yeah, it's definitely the fire hose. You turn on log statement equals all on a busy system and, and whoo, <laughs> it's not. I, oh, a long min duration. Yeah, yeah, that, that can be, um, that'd be rough too, to zero. You, um, anything else? No, it, pretty much any, anything that's based in a database. The problem is the event triggers don't cover things that are global, uh, which also includes create and drop database, but those aren't that big a deal because those don't happen a lot. Um, so, but things like create sequence, create table, create view, alter, all of those things are logged with their uh, fully qualified names. Um, so the, the coverage is actually extremely good. The big, like I said, it doesn't work with create and drop database because those are global objects. Uh, table it also, space. hmm? Table spaces. Uh, table spaces. That's another good one, yeah. Sorry, I forgot about that. Table spaces, roles, databases. This is the main one. I can't think of anything else off the top of my head. Yeah, it's it really the only one that, that we consider to be sort of a nuisance is roles. Because auditing, creation, and dropping of databases and table spaces is kind of eh. But roles is kind of big, so this is something we'd like to try to address in 9.6, figure out a way to, um, to get that done and, and get that stuff in. All right, so I'm being told we're almost out of time. Are there any more questions? All right, great. Well, thank you very much.